Welcome. Welcome to our first Artist Talk of the Visual Art Series featuring our own Rachel Mellis. I am Jill Double D. Kuhn, Gallery Manager for Fine Arts Programming, and I want you to uh, be able to soak up this insightful exhibition, Fruitful and Fretful, 40 Weeks in Watercolor at the Gretzky Gallery. It only opened for one day last spring before COVID turned everyone's world upside down. We are so pleased to have the gallery open and the opportunity to share this exhibition for real this time with our campus community. Rachel Mellis is an Associate Professor of Art at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University with an MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Professor Mellis teaches printmaking, book arts, and design, and will also be teaching a biological illustration class in the spring of 2021. She lives in St. Cloud with her husband and two young daughters who also have artwork in the show. Mellis has used gouache watercolors and metallic inks in 37 illustrative images to capture her experiences of pregnancy through the metaphor of fruits and vegetables. One element of this show that really captures my heart is the framing and presentation. It begins with a poppy seed and ends with a pumpkin. The changing scale of frames circling the gallery makes the metaphor especially literal and relatable, whether you have experienced a pregnancy or not. Before Rachel begins her talk and we follow up with some questions, students attending this live stream to, to fulfill part of their FAE, Fine Arts Experience requirement, should know the following. During the presentation, a code will be clearly displayed on the screen for five minutes. At that time, please click the screen. Oops. At that time, please click the link in the video description below and fill out the form that comes up. You must do this within five minutes of the code being displayed or you will not receive credit. If you have any issues, please email fae at csbsju.edu. I would now like to turn this over to our featured artist, Rachel Mellis. Good evening, and thank you for being here with us tonight. I want to start by thanking Jill for her marvelous introduction and I want to thank Jill and her gallery assistants for the work they did last spring and maintained all summer to make this gallery space look so beautiful. Next, I'm going to show you pictures of the space, close-ups of the work, and talk to you about my process. First, a few more thank yous. Thank you to Tanya, Kevin, Adam, Grace, Katie, Leslie, and everyone at Fine Arts Programming who stuck with this show through so many changes beyond our control. You made this physical and virtual space possible. Thank you. Thank you to the Faculty Development and Research Committee and my colleagues here at St. Ben's and St. John's for funding my frames and supporting my work overall. Thank you to Maureen Fox for motivating me to start framing the first half of these paintings by offering me a show in her salon several years ago. And last but not least, thank you to my teachers, friends, and family, especially my parents, whose pottery you see in the gallery here. My husband, who you see here. My daughters, who you see here, and my stepsons, not pictured, 
for the inspiration they all provided me and the patience they all extended to me over the years. Someone asked me the other day where and when I got the idea for painting these fruits and vegetables that are used as metaphors for the size of a fetus or embryo. The simple answer is that I got the idea from viewing this part of the Baby Center website, their real world guide to baby size. Well, pregnant with my second child, sort of pictured here in 2015. The more complicated answer is that I have made art about nature, fruits and vegetables and seed pods forever. Here are examples of prints and artist books of seed pods I did in college, grad school, and while teaching at Kansas State University. This history of mine is why I have what Jill calls my generational wall in the show. It features work from my parents, from my past, like this apple watercolor from my homeschool high school days, and from my kids who made their own versions of some of my fruits and vegetables. On the right, you can see their two pumpkins. Here is a close-up of work I did in grad school called Seed Mix. Just as the millions of eggs within me were present from week 20 of my own mother's pregnancy, and the mitochondrial DNA from my babies still lives inside of me. We all carry our pasts and our futures unconsciously. And I believe art is one of the ways our unconscious comes to fruition and lives for future generations. Practically speaking though, the answer to when and where I got this idea comes from wanting to be home with my children more than I had been able to be before, which forced me to find a new art form. I couldn't bring them along to my St. Ben's book art studio until they were older, which caused me to start drawing in the home studio you just saw before. Throughout my home, not just in the studio, I found myself constantly sketching my kids while nursing, playing, and especially when they were sleeping. Here are drawings I did of my youngest in her first weeks. I was fascinated by how her hair lightened quickly and by how much her face looked like a moon or a pear squished against my body. These drawings led to me and my oldest making kitchen table prints from the drawings. The series you see here is a mixture of linoleum cuts that my youngest is pointing at on the left hand picture and monoprints made from half a pear and perhaps a potato seen on the photo in the right. My drawing was spurred on by collaborating with my artist friend, Aramie Stewart. She and I have been sending each other daily sketches of our children one way or another since 2016. Here are examples from one of the blogs we kept that you can find linked to on my website. Besides drawing, I used a sabbatical to try to learn calligraphy. I started with pointed pen, but you can see the brush creeping in. Even though I was a bit afraid of it at first, I found myself drawn to brushes and paints in a way I had not been in years. Gouache paint, which has more binder and opacity than watercolor, proved to be a perfect blend between my usual practice of careful scratching, carving, and pressing, and my childhood love of fluid watercolor. Honestly, I can't remember what came first, the choice of medium or the choice of subject matter. But since my first subjects were so tiny, I got hooked on the idea of detailed, layered, dry brushwork for the series before I fully realized what I was getting into. Another reason I started this series had to do with seeing a kumquat as a metaphor for week 10. 
I struggled with what the size of a kumquat would mean to someone not even familiar with one. It seems to be a rare item in this rural Midwestern part of the world, or at least I had only encountered one once at a neighbor's as a child. On the other hand, items I am more familiar with, like the apples my parents grow, are rare in other parts of the world, or in one of the many food deserts in our country. My husband says he was an adult before he saw an avocado, the items so trendy today. Basically, just as people make fun of the trendiness of avocados, on some level I was struck by the elitism of the idea that hard to find fruits and vegetables would help all mothers, all mothers, visualize their unique baby. It also just plain struck me as kind of funny, the whole fruit and vegetable metaphor. So then I got enamored with the idea of making the scale of the fruits and vegetables as accessible as possible to more people by getting them out of the grocery store or website and onto paper. My long-term goal is to turn this project into a book, preferably with two scale pages. One of my favorite forms of expression is taking a metaphor and making it literal. So for now, I have kept things simple. Just the surface of the produce and just the title of the week. I leave it up to you to determine whether the items actually look like babies or mothers on some level, or flowers, or seeds, or other body parts, or taut or squishy bellies, like mine in the left-hand Instagram photo, or vessels for potential life, or empty shells. One thing is for sure, I tried to work from life rather than photos whenever possible, even when that life was fading. Remember, though, that I had started with the smallest items and had no idea what kind of trouble I would get into. The leafy veggies were hardest, because they changed the fastest, and often had to be pinned in place as they wilted. Another reason I worked from life was to focus on surfaces and the tension between transparency and opacity that I constantly felt, not only as I looked at the fruits and vegetables, but as I held and longed for a connection to my baby that was more tactile and more visual than possible at the time. The realism got especially ridiculous when dealing with the pineapple's repeating pattern. I had to create tape landmarks for myself on the surface of it, like a planet. You can't see it very well here, but the blue pieces on the painting are also on equivalent places on the fruit. In the meantime, my uninhibited kid drew it and the rutabaga much better. What became extra funny about the process of searching for anthropomorphic produce at exactly the right height or weight, though, besides the stairs I got in the grocery store when I weighed a dozen of each melon before choosing just one to take home, was how imperfect the metaphors were even at that theoretically mathable level. Not only does every real fetus develop at a different rate, and the baby center's, quote, real-world guide doesn't account for multiples or babies born late. But also the website switched back and forth between weight and head to rump and head to heel measurements. I didn't really figure this out until after I attempted to make a giant mango because it was listed after spaghetti squash, not realizing that the metaphor at that point was more about weight. Hopefully, seeing these process photos has added to your enjoyment of these paintings and maybe inspired you to paint too. 
Remember, realistic painting does not need to be your goal. When I was painting this watermelon for the fourth day of an hour or so in a row, my oldest asked if she could help with my book. She painted a watermelon across two pages in about five minutes, then declared us done. I'll never forget her disappointment when I explained that I still had to keep going. She had really wanted to make my life easier and to get me to play more directly with her. It was at that point I cheered her up by promising her and her sister a place in their first art show. So hopefully she forgives me for that and for telling this story. I also hope that my students watching this will understand the benefit of having a practicing artist for a professor and be inspired by how a simple idea carried to its extreme or repeated many times over time can fill a gallery and having a show is still possible when you have a family. Honestly, that wasn't something I was sure of, even though my parents are self-employed potters who have run their own business since studying art and English at St. Ben's and St. John's years ago. They have made a life for themselves that emphasizes art, independence, and environmental sustainability. But they did not work much away from our home while they homeschooled us. So it has been quite a learning experience for me to try to balance my teaching. Honestly, that wasn't something I was sure of, even though my parents are self-employed potters who have run their own business since studying art and English at St. Ben's and St. John's years ago. They have made a life for themselves that emphasizes art, independence, and environmental sustainability. But they did not work much away from our home while they homeschooled us. So it has been quite a learning experience for me to try to balance my teaching with parenting and art making. Like the title of this book, Emily Hart Roth, made about my parents and other similar artists. Art, a lifestyle. This show at St. Ben's, to me, represents that lifestyle. A triangulation of teaching, parenting, and art making. And I hope that my children and students at least somewhat agree. Don't be fooled by the idyllic Instagram photos flashing before you. There are lots of unseen interruptions between moments of child and parent painting together. It really did prove possible for us to collaborate though, and we still do a little bit most days, especially now that the pandemic has forced me to work even more from home and them to occasionally learn remotely. Having children has transformed my art, teaching, and life completely and positively. I hope, though, that this show also raises awareness and empathy about the uncertainty inherent to fertility and pregnancy. I feel strongly that we should be more honest about the grief that can surprise us, whether or not we have children, at any stage of our so-called childbearing age. Well, I personally had two early miscarriages, one before each of my children, a kidney bean and poppy seed. People I love dearly have experienced much worse, like pumpkin or beyond. We now know that a quarter of pregnancies end in miscarriage, and rates of pregnancy loss and maternal mortality are highest for women of color, especially black and indigenous mothers and children. I hope we start to work harder as a country to ensure that all people like the Ojibwe and Dakota people whose land this gallery stands on, get as much access to respect and health care as people who look like me. I hope these paintings speak to all women as mementos of lives or eggs we have carried. My beloved and stubborn maternal grandpa Tom used to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day for having a mom. Similarly, I hope everyone who has a mother, so everyone, will remember during this difficult time, that people of all races, gender identities, sexual orientations, and ages are, to our cores, opaque, unknowable, perishable beings whose lives deserve care, respect, and autonomy. Our Mother Earth also deserves our concern, as we are forever tied to her. Like I tried to show in my mashup, of a bean and a uterus by da Vinci. As singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell said, we are stardust and we are golden and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. 
While we fret about whether vaccines contain toxins, I learned from author Eula Biss when she visited our Literary Arts Institute here at St. Ben's that it's already too late. The same toxins have been found in 99% of American umbilical cords. Sadly, especially high levels of mercury, lead, and PCBs pass to the fetuses of those living in poverty. We literally are where we live and what we eat. If this art show has only served to make you hungry, I hope it will make you hungry, as another singer-songwriter Tracy Chapman sang, for a taste of justice and truth rather than the bitter fruit, or at least for eating and sharing something healthy. To all of you at home, I hope you have enjoyed my show. Those of you already on campus are still welcome to visit it before it closes this September 26, 2000. And if anyone has ideas for another show, space, or a permanent home for paintings at a birth center, please let me know. To my kids watching me at home tonight, instead of being able to run around this gallery again, or instead of watching our usual reruns of The Great British Baking Show, it's time to stop eating dessert and brush your teeth. For the rest of you, thanks so much for listening. I look forward to conversing with Jill and hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, that, on so many levels, um, I'm not gonna think about fruits and vegetables the same way. <laughs> um, this is the portion um, of our time together in which I have some questions for Rachel, and I invite you who are watching um, through live stream to submit questions as well. Uh, Rachel, the, yes. process <laughs> <laughs> the process of growth starts with planting a seed and relying on nature and nurture to control that process. Um, in this time of COVID, in which many of us feel a lack of control, is there an element of control you gain through this type of visualization and metaphor um, in your art? There definitely is, but I think the other thing that's been going on for me, at least during the COVID time, is maybe one positive is accepting lack of control to a certain extent. I mean, I'm still screaming inside a lot of the time, but uh, I think visualization that I do just in my own mind um, has become more and more about just being part of human history, just being part of the globe, being one of the waves on the ocean, and trying to reduce my sense of ego about what's happening and, mm -hmm. and desire for control. Um, at the same time, I think doing these kind of paintings, um, so yes, they are metaphors that helped me understand or feel like I could know, if not control, but at least know my pregnancy better or my child pre-birth better. But I think also doing them um, just does put me in a much more relaxed state of mind and yes, feel like there is this one little part of the world that I have some expertise in and some joy in and, and yes, a little bit of control, especially I think I mentioned in my talk um, that I, I learned how to do this kind of dry brush method that allowed me to um, feel more like I do when I think when I'm printing, mm -hmm. um, where I could, I could both let the water do the flowing that it does, but also I could kind of still kind of, I don't know, pick a little, pick away at the surface layer by layer and bit by bit like I like to yeah. for my process. Um, I can tell as you just talk about that time in your life, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's the light but there's a little glint in your eye. I mean, it's just, you know, the uh, being a mother, mm -hmm. going through that process um, mm -hmm. uh, is very dear to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a, a lot of people are struggling um, during this time, um, especially when we started with the, the COVID um, home order to be mm -hmm. at home. A lot of people turned to art uh, as a coping skill to find some sort of peace and comfort. Uh, 
you explained that uh, how that provided some comfort in this series. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it still provide comfort for you, mm -hmm. or or maybe some sense of control? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, comfort and flow are probably the words I would use. So. The, the moments that I can be sketching my children or trying to draw something from nature, uh, for me, those are the times when I can enter a, a different state of mind where, again, it's less about myself or my thoughts. And in the case of observing nature and drawing from nature, which I, ha I had not necessarily done for a while until I started this series up again. When I started the series when my kids were, my oldest was small and my youngest was expected, um, Realistic drawing had not been as much my practice for a while. And when I went back to it, um, I realized it's kind of like going to a yoga class and having the instructor tell you what to do or, or Zumba or dance or something where there can be this um, real freedom in giving yourself over to mm -hmm. something else. And so giving myself over, <laughs> it's kind of a metaphor for parenting in a way. It too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Giving myself over to, to trying to copy a thing, which, I mean, clearly I, I hope and I think they're, they're more than copies. But, but in that moment, I am, I mean, I am painstakingly going, how many dots are on that cauliflower? And acting as if it's a scientific illustration that someone's knowledge depends on, even mm -hmm. though it doesn't. Um, I, I just, I do it because it relaxes me. Um, and because it, it just brings me such pleasure to, yeah, lose myself and just hours will go by if, if my, my husband, can, you know, and kids are <laughs> content, you know, I, I told Rob I need to thank him so much more <laughs> for all of that time um, in this show. Um, I mean, it just those hours go by and, and then I look up and i am just been looking at the same thing for so long. It like becomes part of my dreams. But if it's a beautiful thing like this, it's just, it's just a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. I um I I feel uh, that as an artist, it it is truly that balance of um, when you get a chance to do your own creative uh, flow and uh, meditation in a sense. Um, you have so much more to give. You fill up. So when it comes time to being with your family, um, there's a richness that you can share. Um, there's more patience. At least I'm speaking personally <laughs> on that part. Um, that if I would have just completely given up my creative mm -hmm. uh, time, um, it, it doesn't arrive in the same amount of time. But it is definitely important to keep. Uh, absolutely. And I think my kids have, you know, art spots all over the house, because I do too. So mm -hmm. at any moment that I might start making art, they might too, and vice versa. I, I've had to tell myself, you know, the whole thing, like sleep when the baby sleeps. Yes. I have to make art when the kids make art. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes the temptation is they're making art, I can do some dishes or something else. And, but um, part of the daily sketches I've done of my children has been to remind myself to stop and be in that moment with them. So that, that's another aspect of all this is just being in that moment. That's part of flow. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, what modeling you're providing for your kids. And that my parents modeled for me, right? Because right. Um, I, I heard an a interview with Ruth, uh, or a child of Ruth Asawa, the sculptor once, and, and the child said, um, I, I've forgotten their name, but they were writing or talking about their mother and their relationship with her and said, you know, we, we loved that she was an artist and busy. Um, if, I mean, we just knew that if we, had, if we wanted her attention, what we did is we went in the studio and wrapped wire, because that's <laughs> what she was doing. Uh -huh. So I feel like I have that going with my family right now, too. It's like they recognize this is, the, this is the way to kind of bond is over our creations together. Mm -hmm. and, and I had that with my mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Parallel play, can we call it that? I love parallel play. Me too. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned just a little bit about um, your ideas for this exhibition mm -hmm. um, when we sadly need to um, take it down. Um, what are your thoughts? You've kept it up for six months so far, can't you? <laughs> We should go at least for another three. <laughs> no, I'm really excited about the, the next show that's coming, um, um, which I know you're going to talk about, too. 
Um, but no, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe the work, the original work will find a home. I'd love it if it found a home where pregnant and women going through birth could, could see it, um, a hospital or birth center. Um, beyond that, I, I would really love to find a way to t have it become a book and, and prints and, and other um, ways that people can access the work. We're going to take some questions from our viewers. And here's our first one. Um, Rachel, is painting going to increase your work, or will you still focus on book arts? Oh, really good question. Um, in the midst of doing this project, I took a pretty long break to do a pretty involved um, book arts project. So. Uh, I don't think it's going to be one or the other. I've never been very good at one or the other. Um, I, I think my work becomes focused around theme, not um, method or, or material necessarily. So I, I see a really strong tie to, to theme, but not that it's necessarily going to stay in this medium. Although I did, I threw the cut pumpkin and cut pear in there partly because I've really been having an itching to start painting some, some of the fruits and vegetables cut up as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question is, uh, which painting is your favorite mm. and why? That's a really good question. <laughs> There's a lot of favorites and a lot of different reasons. So like the leek that's behind Jill and I right now, I did not expect to like painting a leek at all, and I love it. It feels like a bird or maybe one of the ones that's a little more like a baby in its length. Mm -hmm. um, I did not expect to like painting a turnip either, and it became kind of a globe. I love the kidney for what it means to my personal history, uh, the kidney bean. And um, the scallion and the cauliflower for opposite reasons. The scallion took me probably the least time of anything in the bigger ones, and the cauliflower one of the most. Um, but it, it turned out like I actually felt like I could see why it had the word flower in it. Yeah. yeah. I, the cauliflower is one of my favorites mm -hmm. as well. Um, but how can you ask me to pick a favorite? It's like picking a favorite child. I know. <laughs> I love them all the same. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love the poppy seed too. And, and um, from the 88 students uh -huh. who were in here yesterday for our FAE, um, some of the comments were that they really loved um, the blueberry, um, your, the pineapple, the watermelon. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who are wondering where I was staring, I was staring off at where they at are. the art, mm -hmm. where they're located. <laughs> Sorry, new at this. Um, let's see. Um, I think that's it for questions. Yeah, I think if anyone wants to add a comment on what your favorite one is, I'd be curious to see that too. Yeah, but thank you, Jill, for the excellent questions and, and audience members. Ah, it's it's been a blast. Um, thank you for sharing your art and your process, motivation, and answering our questions this evening, Rachel. Thanks to all of you for spending time with us in this beautiful gallery and garden featuring this beautiful woman's art. The show continues through Saturday, September 26th at the CSB Goretzky Gallery. We are closed on Sundays and Mondays we're open 11 to 9 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. FAE Wednesdays happen uh, from 11 to 7 p.m. And we allow in a limit of 10 masked visitors for 15 minutes in the gallery at a time. Please join us for our next live stream artist talk on October 15th at 5 o'clock in which we share the art of Melissa Cook Benson. Her exhibition at St. John's uh, at the Art Center lo located at St. John's University called The Pieces of Me showcases large graphite drawings depicting her life as an artist, mother, and wife. Melissa will share her meditative drawing process as well as her experiences sharing creative time in a house filled with two young daughters and fellow artist and husband during these COVID times. <laughs> Good night, stay well, live artfully. <laughs>